All right, I'm pretty excited for this episode of Choir Practice because I've got my straight-up bromance up from New Jersey, and I'm originally a Jersey boy, so say hello to everybody. How you doing? I'm sorry that you're from New Jersey, too. I'm sorry that you're from New Jersey. I get it, yeah. On my, on my way out, hopefully soon, yeah. Um, you want to tell everyone what the show is? In Choir, case they've been hiding yeah, around. hey, Choir Practice. A little decompression, uh, sometimes with a cocktail. Um, police get together and do that kind of stuff to keep us sane. You know. Well, it didn't work for you because you're, I mean, the fact that you're doing this show with me shows that you're a little bit broken. Yeah, I've been told that. <laughs> but, but we're going to talk about being broken <laughs> today, <laughs> right? Yeah, sure. Um, I want to start off by a quick shout out to our friends over at Warrior 12. Super excited about my new shirt that they sent me. Gun control isn't about guns, it's about control. That's the truth. As we hang out here in the People's Republic of Connecticut, where basically all of my guns are now illegal. Brent, that's for you. Um, and a shout out to our friends over at Miniman Coffee. They don't give us any money, but they do give us coffee, and it's delicious. So maybe they could send more coffee and more money. All right, now, <laughs> who are you again? So my name is Tom Rizzo. Uh, I'm a captain. I'm in my 23rd year in New Jersey. Um, I could smell the finish line at this point. There you go. And, uh, you know, I openly say opportunities like this, I consider myself blessed. Um, I, I said just, you know, yesterday being Law Enforcement Appreciation Day, it's nice when we have days set aside where people appreciate us, but I could tell you, uh, those of us still in the trenches, um, I think owe an emphatic thank you to uh, people that are out there supporting us. We can't do it without them. And that's really my platform uh, where I, I do believe in, in fixing uh, connection and support from within the ranks before we obsess about what's going on outside the ranks. You know, one of the things that we've seen happen in the last couple of years, and we've been saying this for years, that the pendulum was going to swing back, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so we saw in 2020 during all the riots and everything, people were taking down their thin blue line flags, yeah. they were taking their I back the blue bumper stickers off, and they were afraid to, um, to support law enforcement. And if nothing else, it's become socially acceptable again to support law enforcement because people are suddenly going, yeah, that defund the police thing probably wasn't the greatest idea we've ever <laughs> sure. had. And, and I look to look at it as if in 2015, all of a sudden, there's a massive increase in the number of people dying of heart attacks, right? And, and this is probably a lousy comparison because we, we don't have a problem with policing. But let's say there was this massive increase in the number of people dying of heart attacks. You're not going to be like, you know what? We got the solution. We're going to defund cardiologists. We're going to defund cardiothoracic surgeons because they suck. They're the worst. So we're going to take away their money. We're going to take away their staff. We're going to take away their training. That's going to solve the problem. So for people who do believe that there's a problem with policing, the solution has never been to take away their ability to train, has never been to take away community support. It, it just made no sense. And so that's why the, the pendulum swinging back. But are you surprised at all, though? So this is where maybe I create some friends. Uh, but probably more adversaries from within. Uh, I'm not surprised. Why do I say that? Well, because, right, we sacrificed the very mission that we had. You know, as cliche it may sound, right, protecting and serving. Right? Well, that's what we do. Uh, when you blur the lines yourself, how are we, and I say this all the time, is it a thin blue line or is it a thick blurred line? Uh, we, we, that famous quote, right, in our age learned journey from savagery to civility, let's hope we haven't bought a round trip ticket. Whose fault is that? That's us. We allowed that narrative, we allowed our mission, we allowed our culture to be hijacked. We allowed that from within the ranks. Our leadership elements from throughout the country allowed it to be hijacked. So I don't have any type of shocked face for you that a pendulum should even have to swing back. The dichotomy and dynamic of policing hasn't changed. You don't ever change the strategy. The strategy is to protect and serve, as cliche as it may sound, right? And that's everybody, right? Whether you apprehend or whether you're a victim, either which way, it's, the, it's human dignity should be at the core of the mission, but the mission is what it is. Strategy has to stay the same. Tactics can evolve, right? With equipment, with logistics, with technology, tactics change. Uh, we practice and preach passenger side of approaches on motor vehicles. Why? So I don't get hit by a vehicle and I could take three quarters of that vehicle and clear that vehicle for safety purposes, right? That, that's a quick, you know, dissertation. You don't tell me don't stop violators anymore. Right. And then, well, but we have leadership elements from throughout the country. Yeah, you know, I know what we'll do. We'll just let the violators go. So why am I going to be surprised when outside influence comes in now and tells us how to do it via defund, via reimagination? We're the ones that serve the dish. 
There was a guy that I got into. Well, you see me get into it yeah. on LinkedIn and yeah. Facebook and everything all yeah. the time. Bernie just rolls his eyes and says, <laughs> I love you anyway. <clears throat> but I'll, I'll call out the haters, sure. right? But this guy made a, a point on LinkedIn, and my immediate gut reaction was to want to fight him. And then I realized he was right, and he said part of the problem that we have in law enforcement went from being when <clears throat> we were called to serve and protect to when we were being called law enforcement. Yes. And, and I had to take a step back and go, man, that's a, that's a fair point, because what he was getting at was in 2020, 2021, with the lockdowns and the riots and everything, when you saw law enforcement be weaponized yep. to enforce things like mask mandates and things that weren't laws, yep. that is where we had a breakdown, um, a, a big breakdown on the societal side yep. of things. And so when, when he made that statement, it kind of hit me in the gut a little bit because I, I wanted to immediately defend law enforcement. And then I realized that there is a perception that law enforcement has gone from serving and protecting to enforcing laws that in some cases, gun control, as, yeah. as you saw in that shirt, may be violations of the very oath that they upheld. You have made the point, and we'll talk about the book here, yeah. that um, the profession has kind of eaten itself alive to a little bit of uh, a degree, right? I think cop cannibalism that happens throughout the country. Uh, what's my point? Thousand miles from here, if a police encounter does not appear on the face value to good, look good, let's talk about the big booms. I speak of nothing unless I visit it. You visited the border and then you speak upon it, correct? Why? Because that's coming from a position now of what? Interaction and education because you walked it. Yeah. So for me, I go to every hotspot. I've been to Minneapolis several times. Chicago, Kenosha, Memphis. You name the hotspot I've been. And you know what I do? I don't dress as a police officer. I dress as a human damn being. I walk the streets and I talk to people. And you know what people say? Emphatically they say it. We don't have a problem with the police. Yeah, no, well, I'm not gonna put a blue line sticker on my car. But no, the police are here, yeah. Yeah, okay, they do what they do. It's media and it's oppositionists and it's our own that subscribe to a narrative from a position of uneducated. So from a thousand miles when a chief, a sheriff, an administration says, we condemn the actions of Officer Jim Jones for what he or she did on a contextual video that you don't know the entire story of. And they very well could be wrong. How about we start the story at chapter one, not at chapter four. I'm just asking you. I didn't say incite your opinion or, and invoke your opinion. How about just tell me a factual story? You could say that at a press release. Or, at the very least, I challenge you to then go ahead and highlight the, uh, the heroic actions on a daily. Mm -hmm. Don't come to me while you say we're not supported or all you see on the news is negatives when you yourself could drive your car the way you want to. Why don't you put out the officer who delivered a baby, the officer who saved somebody from a burning building, the officer who took a round, but you don't know their names. I don't know their names. But I know the names of the officer who kneeled on somebody. I'm just asking you. If we have the ability to advertise that according to, that's not your responsibility. The fact that you guys do it, you will always have my support, my respect, and my loyalty. That's us. So I'm not going to point the finger at anybody, whether liberal, whether conservative. I'm not going to point the finger at anybody. I'm going to point it at myself first. Well, I think you're right. So my background, I, I worked in TV for years. Yeah. He was in law enforcement forever. Yeah. And, and when I say forever, I mean the guy's like 84 years old. He looks like he's 42. I was about to say he's an alien, man, because <laughs> he don't age. Yeah. Right but we, we were taught how to make cops look bad. Yeah. And police officers were their own worst enemy 100%. because there would be a, an officer involved shooting mm -hmm. and we would call up and talk to the PIO mm -hmm. and it would be a good shoot, man, yes. totally clean. And he would go, no comment. Yeah. And I'm like, you freaking idiots. Yeah. Now you made it look like he's guilty. Yep. Now you made it look like there's something to hide. Yes. And then on the flip side, you have not only is there a, <clears throat> a complete vacuum with those positive stories being put out there, but when you do have that dancing cop on TikTok who gets 10 million views, they beat the shit out of that guy because like that guy, that's not what law enforcement's all about. Well, you know what? Maybe that's part of the problem of why we had this breakdown in 2020 because we have failed to humanize the men and women behind the uniform and show that you are me and vice versa. Yep. And so maybe instead of shitting on the cop that got 10 million views for, for dancing like a goofball at a traffic stop, maybe understand that the reason you got 10 million views is because people want to see that. But hold on though, right? So how do you get connection though? It's by actually taking the ego out of your leadership element and not always having the answer. Mm. So what I say this all the time, and I, and I got called out for it. You talk about learning from an opposition or an opposing side. I got schooled by a BLM group during a heated debate and they called me out and they said, it's propaganda what you guys are doing. 
We didn't ask you in our communities to come in and roll in a tactical unit truck, let us do pull-ups off it, do super soaker challenges, and hand us teddy bears. We didn't ask for that. Your idea of connection with our community is to take your tactical equipment and show us how it could be a fun fair. You know, we asked for human dignity. So if you have to arrest us, maybe, just maybe, and you had to tackle us and beat on us and do all that good stuff that maybe could have been constitutionally justified, maybe you wipe off my face when my family sees me. Maybe the fact that if you blew my door off the hinges, maybe you put the door back together. And I'm gonna tell you this for a fact, I only have success because of my team. But when we started to evolve as to treat somebody else like it was your family that might have made a mistake. See, I don't know about you, my man, I don't walk on water. I've made about every mistake there is to make in this human life and probably more there, there is to come. So for me, heaven forbid the fact that I wear a sidearm and a shield, it doesn't put me in a position that you should be able to judge other people as to, you know, uh, with their right to get into heaven or hell, right? So there is a job. So I, I, I teach and preach to the different, the differentiation of personal versus serious. I take my job serious because that's what professionals do. That's how the pros do it. As soon as I realize to stop taking things personal, and I use this for my children, try it for yourself. Line up your four, for me I have four, line up your four kids and go ahead and do a race for who's the fastest in the family. The competitive nature in us starts off by taking it what, seriously? Well, when one pulls away from the other, what happens? They take it personally. And they start to say, he's cheated, she started too quick, he's your favorite. And you lose the ability to run the race at all. You trip yourself, you get exhausted. Police officers throughout the country, they take it so personal, they lose the ability to act like a pro. So this isn't your mortal enemy. I got, I, I got schooled by the Moss brothers. They're identical twins, combat vet, uh, several times deployed. And you know, uh, th they made a name for themselves as to what they did in their missions by actually engaging on a different way of doing it. And, and, they, and I quote in the book, you know, those that you guard, you don't have to love, and those that you fight, you don't have to hate. You can operate in the middle, and that's how the pros do it. So I don't take it personal. I mean. The criminal element has a job to do, right? <laughs> and the police have a job to do. It, 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 there's almost like, I, I've had better relationships, and I'm sad to admit this, from the criminals that understand the game, and I don't say that to negate the importance and the significance of it, than I have from administrative climates. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it hurts me because the outside does so desperately want to support us. Mm -hmm. I've seen a boomerang effect, I know you have. Since the upheaval of law enforcement as we know it, I've seen a, a boomerang effect as to more people outright supporting us, but I'm asking why did it have to get to that point? Mm. Yeah, no, you're right. You've seen it with, you've seen good chiefs, you've seen, I mean, you teach all over the country too, right? Let's yeah. talk a little bit about that. Uh, so, you know, and I agree with you because you know, I just had a class yesterday in Connecticut and one of the big things I, part of my training is pulling cops back up by the bootstrings and getting them back engaged. You know, you get the people who feel like they've been beaten down and beaten down. Okay, guys, listen, we got to get over this. The last three years are gone. Yeah. Okay, forget the, yeah. the whole fight. It's yeah. over. Yes. But you know what the constant is? It's you. You showed up for work every single day. You put your gun belt on. You didn't know what COVID was or what it did to you. You, you had to struggle with all the rioting and the protest and the anti-police rhetoric. It's over. You know why we're succeeding? Because you show up to work every day. But you have to understand that 90% of your population loves you. The average person only deals with a police officer about 10 minutes in their lifetime. Yes. But we let what media influences do to us create that vacuum. But let me take it personal. Let me respectfully argue on this. And I mean that, yeah, and I mean this with love and respect. That is because our leadership elements, and again, I use this, right? The reason why we, not cops, but we're no different, give up so fast is because we obsess about how far we have to go compared to how far we've come. Absolutely. Let me ask you, man, I'm gonna tell you, I never got advanced training on how to deal. Let me go back with the lowest form of conversation when I first started. Well, when I first started, if you took a pulse that went like this and made it go like this, that was a big deal. Now I tell you, hey, Rook, go get more Narcan and go. We didn't celebrate to the opposition the fact that we weren't equipped to deal with a, a, a heroin epidemic and save lives on the daily that used to be an anomaly. We didn't celebrate that. Then we move on to what? Civil disobedience. Did you get advanced training in that? You know what I got was gear. Put it on. Right. Well, what do I, I, I don't know. What's the levels of forces? What's the engagement? How do we use canines? How do we use OC? Nobody gave it to us. You see one excerpt of a video of now me doing the best I can with it? Man, you're, you're a business you know, juggernaut. Any other viable industry would have went bankrupt. Totally. 
So when I get a C minus in my gig, ill prepared, no logistics, mm -hmm. and ill resourced, I'm gonna celebrate that C minus and I'll be vulnerable to the community and the public and say, we did our damn best of what we could. We made a dollar out of 15 cents, but we don't do that. You know what leaders do? We apologize first. Yes. Hey, I am sorry that I failed in this endeavor, ill prepared. I teach this in my class. Go into a department store right now that sells clothes and say, I want a broiled steak at the counter. You know what they're gonna tell you? We don't do that here, son. You do a police department, I'm gonna say, uh, hey, yo, Ka, go grill it up. Uh, Cap, I don't know how to do that. It's all right. And then when the person gets food sick, you know what I do? I discipline your ass. Yep. Oh, that's on us, man. That's on us. And I'm sorry, I don't care whatever enemies I make of it. But, and I say, but don't ever let me interrupt your next conference and everybody congratulating themselves on the job well done. It drives me damn batshit. Because yeah. I'm the one. I wear every one of my scars, every one of my scrapes, every one of my bruises. And I made a lot of mistakes, man. And, and I think that that's how the only way to move it forward. If I could ex expose some of my vulnerabilities, my mistakes, my transgressions, to get them to keep showing up. I'm selfish, brother. I got four kids. What am I leaving to them? Mm -hmm. And you've lost guys, too. Hell yes, I have. And, and, and the, the, the worst, you know, I thought I would have learned at 14. <laughs> you know, I saw all the signs, man. You want, you know, truth untold? Uh, you know, all the signs. But we don't see that because we worry about, I always call this, you know, surface resiliency. Check box, man. You get somebody to chuckle today. I always say that line. I stay away from that line of, hey, you good? You don't really mean that. If you really meant it, you'd look me in the face and you would put your phone down and you would engage with me. Mm -hmm. But you know what I did? I did. And yeah, when both of them, at 14, three peas in a pod, kill themselves uh, the same day simultaneously, you would have thought I would have learned, but I didn't. Because it happened again, and a colleague, a friend, uh, you know, yes, he committed suicide by cop by his own department. And uh, that's a no-no in our gig. You don't do that. You don't put another brother or sister police officer in that position. Um, but I'll tell you, my depression was different. Uh, I'm a shelter pet. I, I, I literally, um, my dear, I, I'm Italian and from New York. My mother was everything to me. Uh, she suffered a dog's death of cancer. Um, I had to endure some sights that I wouldn't wish on anybody. And I actually had to come to the truth. And the truth was through therapy, I, don't, I openly admit that, that I literally blamed the same woman that I love so much for missing out on life. I never had a babysitter, she never met my kids, I never got the care packages, I lost the most important person in my life, and, I, and my biggest fan, as we were alluding to before, and uh, way too young, and I felt like I was uh, robbed, and then, what, as a position of authority, and in heaven forbid, a boss, you know, hurt people hurt people, and I hurt the people that I worked with by expecting too much of them and expecting to operate at my speed, and I never once invited my wife at the time, I'm estranged, uh, now, <laughs> Uh, and my four children, I never invited them on the journey that I made them jump in the car with, right? I never asked them, hey, you want me to do narcotics? You want me to go after violent criminals? I don't have to. I could do eight and skate. I never asked them. I never asked them, you want me to skip out on vacations so I can come out number one on the promotional test? You want me to do podcasts? You want me to go out and teach? I never asked them. Because why? We're so ego-led that I know what they want. And uh, I, will, I always say every day you put the, re the rucks out of regret on, and you gotta take some bricks out of that every day, and uh, that's a brick I don't know how I'll be able to you know, take out because I severed those relationships. What can guys learn from that? Uh, to embrace their vulnerability and that uh, we're humans before we put the uniform on. We're humans during the shift and we're humans afterwards. And what are human beings? Uh, no matter what race, creed, color, religion, sexual orientation, humans are perfectly imperfect. So I think if we allow mistakes of the head and we say in every, every other industry, and I take this to heart, because you know why? Doctors killed my mother. Yeah, they missed the cancer that she said, take my breasts, I don't need them. And they said, not necessary. And they metastasized and killed her, like I said, a dog's death. And you know what I got from that? A pillow that they made out of her shirt. No big lawsuits, no nothing. And you know what they say? Well, sometimes shit happens. I'm asking you right now, why can't I as a damn human being, why, because I'm wearing a monkey suit with a badge and a gun, why can't I as a damn human being make a mistake that gets caught on camera and say, I made a mistake, I did, yep. I'm not talking about criminals. Criminal cops, go ahead, lock them up, throw the key away. But I'm saying you're demonizing and you're vilifying us from within. So I say obsess about what's happening within the four walls of your building before you go and pander to the four corners of your district. Mm. And you would see a reciprocity effect in the customer service element that you will, your profitability and relatability 
and support will blast any ceiling you've created. Yeah. Let's talk about the book. Roger that. So this is the logo I did, right? And it's, if you can't see it, it's just about leadership being a perspective. It's taking pieces of you and putting it into the voids that you recognize in other people. But the only way you could do that is being, you know, I guess aware of your environment. You know, you guys often talk about aware of tactical, you know, threats. I talk about emotional threats. So the reason why I said kapakazi is because I do believe that we are on a kamikaze mission in terms of we are expecting our next generation, our current generation, to sit there and sign up for something that legit is a suicide of the culture. What is the culture anymore? If you don't know your mission statement, then how the hell are we supposed to sign up for the mission? Right. So what I did was I gave lessons, a series of lessons, with adages and metaphors and, and accounts as to how to navigate it. Sort of the story that I wish somebody would have told me. And instead of me saying uh, I, I am a hypocrite, I embrace my hypocrisy. Because my attitude is maybe I went through it and survived it. If I could help somebody else though from falling off that cliff, then maybe, just maybe, that starts to put some of the pieces back into my voids that I'll never be able to get back. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that. Um, when did you roll out the book? So it's funny, I, I had to self-publish because I had a time crunch of a major conference I was going to be a part of and I wanted to have it available. So I self-published, but I was blessed. I got mentored by the team Never Quit Guys and Adam Davis, Marcus Luttrell's group. Uh, Adam Davis, a multi-time author, and they mentored me. I, I, I didn't have a problem with writing because for me it was a catharsis of what is stuff I just wanted to get out. Mm -hmm. uh, and I tell you, mm -hmm. I, if one person read it, <laughs> I didn't have my mother with me, but at least a best bud to read it and tell me I did okay. So I did, I reached number one on Amazon. Uh, I, don't, I, didn't, I don't think I deserve that. Uh, I did an audible, I'm an old fashioned guy, like a book in my hand, but they told me to go ahead and narrate it myself. So I had tongue fatigue and I pronounced some words a little <laughs> funny. Um, but uh, it, it was something, it was a bucket list dream of mine to do. And I, and I do intend to do it again, but uh, I, I'm 44 states deep now. I wanna hit all 50 continental states uh, so that I could say I did it uh, because I set out on a mission and I don't wanna say that for me, uh, when my time comes to punch out, I want to believe that I made a soul print, not a thumbprint on the industry. I love it. You know, this, this quote, it's one of my all-time favorite Rocky quotes, and you end one of your chapters in your <laughs> final lesson. Rocky says it best. It's not how hard you hit. It's how hard you can get hit and keep getting up. That's how winning is done. That's right. That is law enforcement right now. <sighs> yeah. Um, and I think that we have gotten up. I think it's about damn time we understand how to advertise that. I befriended at a layover at Atlanta, a, a multi-billion dollar business entrepreneur, and uh, he asked me what I do, I asked him what he did, and he said, he goes, look, I support, support law enforcement. I don't have blue line stuff, I don't. He goes, most people I know don't. Uh, he said, but you guys have an advertising problem. And he goes, and I'm gonna tell you right now, that's your, that's your issue. So he said, you need more people that understand how to give a press conference, how to tell factual accounts, how to say where you got it right, how to say where you got it wrong, how to say when you turn in, tune in to an MMA fight, you're not appalled by the fact that you saw strikes and blows and blood. Same thing, a violent apprehension of somebody who doesn't want to be arrested, as you can attest to, isn't fun. Right. I could tell you from an experienced law enforcement officer more time than me, we would love to take the handcuffs and hand it to you and you handcuff yourself. Am I lying to you? Amen. So I would love that every day. Amen. I'm gonna let you know a little secret. This is gonna rock you, this is advanced physics. Sometimes people don't wanna go to jail. Right. <laughs> so unfortunately, now, I might not be an MMA folk or folk, you know, I might make a boo-boo in a split-second decision. I just might. And, and I didn't see his hand already behind his back in a strike or a this or a that. I might even yell a curse word. I know. I know. I might happen. And what do we do then? There they are. Patches, pins, ranks, and ribbons, scrambled eggs on the hats in front of a camera, apologizing to the public at large for why it is you saw my police officer. But you see the size of that police officer, and that was just a small frame subject. I invite anybody to arrest somebody who doesn't want to be arrested. Or who's high on PCP. I, I invite them. Because no. I'm going to tell you right now, I take fitness seriously, and somebody that has that will is going to get bashed and through you. Because you know why? I don't have the will. I signed up to go to work that day. That's right. Beginning and the end of it. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I'll, I'll use two examples here, and I'm not going to use the names of the individuals, but there's a certain agency in a very large state. Yeah that there was, a, there was a, an officer involved shooting and it was a good shoot. It ended up being ruled a good shoot afterwards, yeah. but the chief, it was fatal. The chief immediately came out and said, this is terrible, what yeah. he did was wrong. 
And then, despite the law preventing this from happening, the chief released the recorded video interview of that officer's interview in the hiring process where they asked him, would you take a life if you had to? And he said, yes. Well, there's only one correct answer there, right? The chief released that mm -hmm. and spun it of the warning signs were all there. If he said no, he wouldn't be a cop because mm. unfortunately you have to be willing to do that. Right. And so the chief stabbed his own guy in the back. Flip that around, you've got a, a sheriff out in Florida mm. who the team ended up shooting a bad dude 58 times and in the press conference after, they said to him, well, why did your officers shoot that man 58 times? And he said, oh, we, we ran out of bullets. Like that is a night and day comparison of how you stand strong for your officers who are doing the right thing. But you, you mentioned before about reform, right? And, and the defund of the police. So I'm asking, why don't we have a national standard as to how to do these events so you don't have those polar opposites? Right. I'm gonna tell you right now, I tell everybody this politically, uh, philosophy wise, operate in the middle. When you're representing a government agency, you have to operate in the middle. So for me, I don't care what acronym is at the end of your name or what party you subscribe to. A good idea is a good idea is a good idea. But I'm gonna tell you factual accounts. I will not give you my opinion unless you ask for it. Here's there the it problem is. with that. And you're right, I agree with you, but here's where I think we have a problem. You have certain police chiefs who are nothing more than political hacks in uniform oh. who are looking for a job on CNN after they get out or a job as an appointee. There's one very big name chief who went from an agency in Texas to an agency in Florida and then got shit canned and was literally the, probably the most hated chief historically in all of America by his own officers and ended up being on CNN as a talking head slamming cops. Ooh. And he actually blocked me on LinkedIn, which I wear as a badge of honor. Thank you very much. But you'll have guys like that who don't actually give a shit about the profession. Of course. They give a shit about their mm. political career when they get out. Well, again, and you could see some of my content, not that I have the answer, I often, in yes, maybe, there's a tone of sarcasm in this, you have national academies, okay, that we say are the prestigious schools of leadership throughout the country. I would ask of you, then how do we keep having those problems? Right. Mm -hmm. You're creating standards now, which there should be, that if a police officer, not a chief, was terminated for some type of conduct, it prevents him or her from getting a job in another agency, as they should be transparent. Yet a chief in a failed administration can turn around because of political patronage and then get a job in another major metro police department. Then we have a failure, and what do we look at? The four or five police officers at the interaction, not the police chief. Mm, totally. yeah. See, for me, I always stand by this mantra, the position shouldn't be serving the person, the person should be serving the position. So if you don't believe in that flipped script, I owe it, I don't, anybody that says thank you for your service, no, 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 that's what I signed up to do. I serve the position of police officer, now of captain. <laughs> it's not like, oh cool, more money, better days off. When you, that should be your metric for succession and for promotion. Sure. So I say, are they metrics to promote the right, the right candidates or are they mash tricks? You tell me, because I'm seeing it, and it, the answer is right in front of us. It doesn't cost bigger budgets. It doesn't cost more logistics or resources or personnel. I call it grocery line etiquette. If you don't know how to hold the door, say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, to your people inside your building, you're going to expect them to then go treat strangers in the public well? How does it, how's that going to work? You know, you're going to think I'm a hypocrite for what I'm about to say here, but despite the fact that I believe that we need to remove politics from policing, right. in my experience with covering the field of law enforcement from a media perspective, I actually find that it's the elected sheriffs who are held in higher esteem than police chiefs in a lot of their communities because they're answering directly to the community, not yes. to the person who's going to appoint them yes. to the role of police chief. Yes. And so it, it, it's sort of a little bit hypocritical to say we need to remove the politics from policing and then to also when say- politically appointed. Right. right. No, I, I think you could blend the two, and I don't know if you would agree with this or not. I'm a fan and advocate, a huge advocate of upward evaluations though. If you had candid evaluations, which are then subjected to consequence or praise yeah. from the working class of your administrations and your police departments, listen, my man, I, everywhere I go, the answers are always the same. 
oh, well, our administration doesn't care. Now, I'm not saying it's true and valid, mm -hmm. but there's what? That's why I call my whole day class the Ivory Tower. It's not a shot at administrations. Psychological separation of connection from the ground level and the ground level, a separation of psychology, psyche, and mission to the administration. So if we do not communicate, but what? It's always what? You're held to a standard line level. I'm now what? I'm white shirt. I'm not meant to be blemished. I'm pure. I'm without sin. That's not real. It doesn't work. And that's what's failing us. When we were out in Arizona and Tucson, we, uh, we had dinner with the new police chief and we did an interview with him in the, uh, where the helicopters take off. Yeah. So we went up in the air with the aerial team and the previous chief that he replaced was, had the highest attrition rates when it came to his agency that they'd ever seen. I yeah. mean, they were losing so many cops. Um, he was a highly controversial political appointee. He mm. came in there um, within the first couple of weeks. He, in uniform with his husband, were on the front lines with Black Lives Matter, um, took a knee, like really pissed off a lot of his guys, would throw his own guys under a bus like that. The new guy came in afterwards, after after this guy was gone, and uh, he has been a part of LAT, uh, part of uh, the Unity tour for years. Has yeah. been riding with the cops. He's been on the job for 27 years, I think, with that department. Those guys love him because he's implementing resiliency training. Um, he's implementing sort of the the health and the spiritual and the fitness side of things. And so. There's just such a night and day difference between guys who are willing to get dirty and roll in the mud and back their officers and at least give them the benefit of the doubt, as opposed to others who will say, if God forbid I see you with a Trump patch, you're going to be fired, but I can go in uniform on the front lines of a Black Lives we'll Matter rally and do thing. the same mm -hmm. thing. It's a double standard. But again, or the fact that I, I say accreditation in spirit is a good idea but in practical application, I thought was, that was to me, that was that shot. And what I mean by that is policy manuals look like this now. Yeah. That your most educated, proficient police officer can violate three policies by the way they park their vehicle and walk into a building. Accreditation. So what I'm saying is if you don't alleviate and loosen the ties in the day-to-day -day human part of policing, driving a vehicle where I have a monitor, a camera, a radar detector, a, a radio going, so to allow me that I scuffed it on a curb and not realize this could happen, what I'm saying to you is you don't blend those two. See, we don't have a recruitment crisis. That's a false narrative. There is no recruitment crisis in this country. There is a retention crisis of the culture. And who do you think your best recruiters are? Your five to seven year officers telling the next in line, you're crazy. Do not sign up for this. Don't you dare intend, because what I say this all the time, it's not a recruitment crisis. You've upped salaries, you've incentivized bonuses to get on, we'll move you, we'll give you fans. I've seen flyers paid overtime. I went, wow, you're gonna pay me for overtime. No kidding, <laughs> wow. They don't know, they're clueless but they won't admit to that they themselves, the first step in what an addiction recovery is admitting you have a problem. Yeah. You need these guys and girls to admit you boys and girls are the problem. Yeah. I'm not throwing stones, I want to partner. So that's why I said to you, the venture now is to partner at least with private sector that want to support us more than get, you know, sending pizza and coffee to the police department. Well, They're desperate to see the engagement. They don't want us to go away. No. Doesn't matter who you subscribe to. I think what we've seen now on a national level, people understand the unintended fallout of not having a police force. Yeah, but to go with what you're saying, you know, we've done it to ourselves too. Fact. Right? That warrior mindset. Yes. What is a warrior? Someone who goes into battle. Yes. If we're pumping these young kids up with that thought process, that's what we get. Yes. Right? We're not infusing them then, oh yeah, well after you do the warrior mindset for three to five years, you can go be a community policing officer. Yes. You can go into the schools. Well, you got that warrior mindset, that paranoia, that holy shit, I can't make a mistake type thing. Yes. You know, we had a, uh, an incident that I used in my class uh, here in Connecticut. You look at a video and the, the lady who's taking the videos, the cops are beating the shit out of this guy, right? Well, the cops do their, their homework because the guy's near the police station. They look at the video, they go, that guy's a suspect in four shootings. Yes. We gotta approach him with care. They approach the guy, so when the video comes out, all you see is, you know, strikes, knee strikes, knee lifts, right? When you look at the body cams of the officers, hey, watch his hands, watch his hands, careful, careful, don't let him do this, don't yeah. let him do that. Their chief gets on there, he's like, you know, I stand by my officers. 
all right, this is great, right? Well, then the next thing is, well, couldn't they have used OC spray or taser? He comes out and says taser use would have been inappropriate, but then he says, I could see where you can understand, you, you might think that the use of OC spray could have worked. Sure. So all on my worst nightmare, I'm thinking somebody to place OC spray, four cops go down, affected by it. The perp isn't affected by it. Well, what did the perp have on him? Why did he keep saying, hold it, hold it, hold it? He had an uh, extra long magazine, a thousand rounds of ammo. I don't know how he did that. A bunch of fentanyl except like that. We would have had three dead cops. The it, truth of the matter is just say they did a great job. But you know what's funny about that? Like in New Jersey, we have OPRA, right? Open Public Records Act. So people can OPRA anything. Policies are all yeah. public knowledge. I've had chiefs argue with me. Oh, you're giving away the secrets. Where I say, why don't you hold PSAs and press conferences as to your policy on pursuits, as to your policy on domestic violence? Oh, what, the criminals, you're getting the secrets? Guys, I'm going to let you in on a secret. YouTube, Google, it's all there anyhow. That's right. You know who I'd rather explain it to? I want a driver of, I don't care what race you are, I don't care what gender you are, I want a driver to understand that the United States Constitution allows me to tell a driver of a motor vehicle, step out of the car for no reason whatsoever. That's not because of your tone, that's not because of your predicate of behavior, I could do it for any damn reason I want. You know who doesn't know that? The motoring public. Mm -hmm. But if I say that, if I say that, whoa, I'm giving away the farm? No, I'm educating people. Now, I'm not saying you're gonna see more blue line flags from that. You know what you're going to see, though? People understanding. And with understanding comes what? Support. Less interactions are so polarized. Give them your use of force policy that says, I can kill somebody for these things. <gasps> yeah, I can. I don't want to, but I can. Shameless promotion time. Okay. Uh, so, yes, you can find me at uh, www.thomasrizzo.com. Very creative website name. You know, like that. Yeah, you like that? Um, the book is available on Amazon. It's also, uh, you know, on the website. I, I do. I teach classes. I had a guest hosting opportunity on On Patrol Live. That was pretty neat. Those guys and girls were incredible. What an opportunity. Uh, you don't realize the support you have until policing when you see these opportunities. But, uh, yes, my full day course is Ivory Tower, and I teach a condensed version, Operation Lead. Leads an acronym. Uh, I do that at conferences. That's where I was at the COPS conference doing that. Uh, I love it. My classes, I have officers come, but they can bring their spouses, significant others. Uh, no additional cost because I want to restore relationships by using the path that I've traveled. <laughs> Parting thoughts? It's nice to have somebody who, you know, in this in this industry, especially as retired police officers, a lot of guys get in this industry to just make money. Yeah. It's just a yeah. cash grab, you know, oh, look at me, I look like a cop, uh, <laughs> refer to me as captain, I've been retired for 35 years, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. you know. <laughs> it's nice to have someone who, who really cares and wants to give back to the, the business of what we're doing and yeah. that cares about our officers. So thank you so much. For no, you. man. Like I said, I appreciate it so much. Thank yeah. you. Parting thoughts? Uh, just to know that we, there's so many, I'm nothing special. There's so many of us that appreciate the support that we receive. You guys don't have to do what you do. And uh, it's just the average Joes and the average Jills that are supporting us that we feel blessed to have. And we do, we want to partner, people like me want to partner with private sector that if they want to put on training and they want to support their police departments, well, maybe by putting together symposiums that we could help uh, get people to inspire them and remind them why they, they do what they do, remind them of their why. You know, my, my children made this for me and I would fight uh, another man to the death if they tried to take it off my neck. Uh, knowing your why is what keeps me waking up every morning and checking in. So. Uh, that's what I'm out here to do, and I won't stop until the air is out of my lungs. So. I love it, man. Yeah. Guys, go buy the book. Kapikaze, absolutely love it. Love this guy. I have a feeling you're going to be seeing a lot more of him on law enforcement today soon. <laughs> Share this video. Tell everybody to go follow this guy. God bless you all, and God bless America. Wow.